This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Well, if you would turn your attention to Luke chapter 17, beginning with verse 20 and verse 21. Notice here the New King James Version. Now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered and said, to, and said the kingdom of God does not come with observation nor will they say, see here, or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is within you. And I'm speaking today simply from the subject, inquire within, inquire within. There are times that we'll spend the whole world going about looking for answers, looking for fulfillment, looking for purpose, and asking everybody on the outside, everybody in this place and that place and the other place. And Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within you. They were asking him when the kingdom would come. Jesus was letting him know the kingdom is already here. It's already here. In fact, in the Amplified version of that particular scripture, it says the kingdom of God is within you, within your hearts and among you, surrounding you. See, when you understand exactly what the kingdom is, the kingdom is about the rule and the domain of the king. Kingdom, it is the domain of the king. It's where the king rules or resides. It is his domain. So if you've invited Jesus Christ into your heart and he is sitting on the throne of your heart and you've indeed not only made him Savior, but you've made him Lord. When, you, when, you, when you've made Jesus your Lord, you are subject to him. You're subject to his lordship, to his lordship. So the kingdom is the rule and the domain of the king. It's wherever the king is. That's why I said the kingdom is within you. If you invite him in, he comes in and takes up residency on the inside of us, and then he rules us. And uh, that is to say that the characteristics of that kingdom then begin to flow in us because, you see, the characteristics of the kingdom come from the character of the king. The characteristics of the kingdom come from the character of the king. And this is why he, he told us in, in, in Romans chapter 14, you know, that the kingdom of God is not drinking and eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. I want you to notice, he's told us what the kingdom is not. It's not eating and drinking. It has nothing to do with the external things that you can see through empirical observation of tasting, touching, seeing, smelling, all of that kind of thing. It has nothing to do with that. This thing is about the inner qualities, the inner virtues. These are virtues. Notice the kingdom of God, righteousness. Say righteousness. And then notice it's, uh, it's peace. Say peace. peace. And then it's joy. Say joy. Isn't it, isn't it wonderful? And, and it's, it's very particular about the order here. Because if you don't have the righteousness, you'll never have the peace. See, if you ever find a person who can mistreat somebody and then go home and sleep like a baby at night, that's a wicked, evil person. You need to pack your things while they're sleeping and sneak out. I mean, really. I mean, you, you don't have peace unless you've learned how to treat people fairly. You've got to be right with people. You can't treat people any kind of way, be a selfish person just looking out for number one and then just think that you, you are right with, with your God and right with your fellow man. No, no, no. Righteousness is about doing what is right. It is the right, being in right standing with God, having equity uh, toward your fellow man. That's about righteousness. Righteousness then gives us the ability to have peace. I mean, when you're cheating people, stealing from people, abusing people, doing freaky things with children, when you're doing all of that, you shouldn't be able to have peace. 
when you don't do righteously. So that's why there's an order to the kingdom. It has little to do uh, with anything on the outside. It's the internal qualities that emanates from the character of the king. God is righteous. God alone is righteous. The, the, there's, the Bible says that there's, there's no righteous one. No, not one. God's the only one. And then he manifested it through his righteous son, Jesus. But the rest of us, righteousness is not what we earn. Righteousness is a gift that comes from him. It is the righteousness of Christ, not the righteousness of our own works. It's the righteousness of Christ. It's righteousness, right? Standing, doing things the God kind of way. That's righteousness. And until you do things in a righteous way, you'll never have peace. And then peace. See, a lot of people who are actually seeking happiness are not seeking happiness. They're actually seeking peace. And here's the thing that I've, I've often discovered. I've never found a person who has peace that was not happy. So see what the world is, is, is thinking, but, well, I deserve to be happy. No, no, no. If you were at peace, if you come into this right standing where I'm going to be right with God, and, and when you get in right standing with God, you realize I don't control the attitude of anybody else, and I don't have the power to change anybody else, and I'm just going to deal with this right here, just, just right here, and I'm not going to let anybody else's insanity of what they're doing in their life and how they choose to live their life. I'm going to be right with God because I can't choose for them, but I can choose for me, and God can let his peace come into my heart. And the peace does not mean that it is perfect. But the peace means that God holds me in the midst of the insanity that is in my world around me. It means that when I have peace, it means that even in the midst of frustration and aggravation that is trying to attack my life, that I've got a greater one that abides with me. This is not the absence of problems. It is the presence of God. It's God saying, I got you, baby. Lay right here. Lean on my, sho my shoulder here. I got you. I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. And if you ever have the righteousness element, you will have peace. See, there is no peace to the wicked. When you don't do right and you don't treat people right, you mess up peace. Peace has to do with, with the harmony of things flowing together, even in your body. The first sign of the, the disruption of peace is sickness in the body. When he says, peace be unto you, healing, peace actually in the, when, when they give that word, when you find Jews that say shalom, shalom is not just peace like, you know, just peace out, you know, no, no, no. Shalom, peace, it, it, it speaks of health, it speaks of blessing, it speaks of protection. When they speak shalom, shalom, the peace of God is wholeness. It is wholeness wholeness, nothing broken, nothing missing, wholeness that can only be found in God. So the kingdom of God, you're looking for the kingdom, looking for the kingdom, looking for the kingdom. He says when they say, look here, look over there, he says, forget all of that. No, 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 the kingdom is within you. Seek to do and to be right. Seek to be right so you can do right. Seek to, to be right so you can do right. Accept the righteousness that comes as a gift from God. It has nothing to do with what we've earned. Remember the, the, the prodigal son who left home when he came home? First thing they said, bring, him, bring the robe. It was a representative of the robe of righteousness. That even when we've messed up and even when we've sinned, God will clothe us in his righteousness. And the next thing, once you've got that robe on in, of righteousness, next thing that manifests in your life is peace. And then once you have peace, the fruit of peace is really joy. Joy, that's, there's that happiness that people are looking for. And isn't it amazing that all of the people that are searching for happiness try to jump over step one and two, which is righteousness that le leads to peace. And once you get the peace, peace manifests itself in joy. It says that I'm going to have joy no matter what's going on. I don't care if my spouse is acting crazy today. It says, you know what? The joy of the Lord is my strength. I get my joy from him because I'm rooted and grounded in him because I talk with him and he let me know that I am still the apple of his eye. You know, so when you walk with God, it is through that righteousness and peace and joy. That's kingdom. That's kingdom. He says, it's not the outside stuff out here. It's everything that happens in your heart. It's the thing that happens in your heart. And see, these are qualities of the heart qualities of the heart. He says the kingdom is within you. The kingdom 
is within you. And you see, you cannot externalize what you have not first internalized. If you've not internalized it, you cannot externalize it. If it's not become a reality on the inside of me, it can't become a reality on the outside of me. You, you have to be before you do and then do before you have in that order. There's an order. You be, then you do, then you have. I've got to internalize it, then I can externalize it. Some of you may not know, but I'm a world's religions major. And so I studied various religions from around the world, and little did I know that I would travel the world and be encountered by so many different uh, religions around the world. I was in a place in Asia, and, and I went to, uh, it was a worship place of pagan, paganism. One of the temples that I went in had 13 different gods around the wall, 13. And, and they were bringing food and libations uh, for, for, the, for their gods. And, and, and three different religions met there. But one of the things in my, in my study of world religions, I, I studied the Hindu religion of, of, uh, of Brahma. And Brahma was their supreme god, and they had other lesser gods. But the legend goes in the Brahman religion uh, of the Hindus that there was a divine breath in all of mankind, all mankind in their minds were once gods as they walked the earth, but many of them used, they corrupted that power and became abusive. And so Brahma, the, the supreme god of the Hindu religion, he says to the lesser gods as he called a council of them and said, we must take the divine breath from them and hide it. And they said, he asked, where should I hide it? And so the council of the lesser gods, they said, well, you should dig and hide it in the earth. And then Brahma thought and he said, no, if I hide it in the earth, one day man will dig and discover it. And then they said, well, maybe you should then plant it in the midst of the ocean. They'll never find it there. He says, no, 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 man is very curious. And one day he will explore the depths of the ocean and he will find it there. And then they said, well, no, no, well, well, we should hide it on top of the tallest mountain. He says, no, no, they're still curious. They will climb every mountain, and eventually they'll find it. And they said, well, we don't know where in the world you can hide it, that they wouldn't find it. And then Brahma said, I'll hide it within man himself. And he'll never think to look of it there while he is digging in the earth trying to find the treasures that are there, while he's exploring the depths of the sea, and he will climb every mountain around the world. He'll be climbing the mountain and not knowing that that divine breath is always within them. But Jesus put it this way. And, and listen, I'm not a Brahmin. I'm not into that. I am a Christian. I believe in Jesus, that Jesus is the way not a way. I'm, 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 listen, I'm, I'm born and raised a Christian. I, I believe in Jesus as the only way, you know, uh, to heaven. And you can call me narrow-minded if you want to, but you know, narrow is the gate and straight is the way. But all of this begins to tell us something about the divine nature that God himself comes as he tabernacles, wrapping himself up in human flesh. It's amazing. Uh, one of the reasons that Jesus said, the works that I do shall you do also. See, he was doing God kind of works on the earth. And he says, the works that I do shall you do also. And greater works than these shall you do because I go to my Father. So he says, you're going to do some great things, and God wants to be able to do it. And I just want you to know, church, that we have stepped into a day now where God is turning the eyes off of what's happening in the pulpits around the world. And he's turning, there is a giant spotlight. I've seen a vision from heaven. There is a giant spotlight on what's happening in the seats in the pews where there are saints that are sitting there with their ministry dormant and God is activating the ministry not to the saints the ministry of the saints where God in you you got to believe that God can move through your hands speak through your lips and that it will not be to bring attention to you but it will be to bring glory to God this thing is about Jesus Christ him lifted up when I die they don't need to remember my name my legacy is not important what's really important is the legacy of who Jesus is 
Bishop Brown is not going to be able to save anybody's grandchild, but there is a Savior that I've talked about. So let them remember Jesus. Let them remember Jesus. Point people to Jesus. We are signposts pointing people to Jesus. Don't bring the attention on how nice your billboard is. It's not about your billboard. Your billboard ought to be pointing them to something higher. But there's an empowerment that is coming where the, 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 the five-fold ministry gift is just simply there for the equipping of the saint to capacitate you to be able to do what God has called you to do and to be what God has called you to be. There are people that have said, God, I will do what you want me to do and I'll go where you want me to go. And this is when you find that the kingdom, he's saying, is right at hand. It is so close, it's right around you. There's a power of God that is in somebody else and people think that they got to get to the chief potentate apostle. And you don't know you're sitting beside power now that you don't even understand. You're sitting by somebody that has had to pray through demons and get hellish things out of their mind, stuff to make them. You don't really know who you're sitting next to. Touch your neighbor, say, power in the pew, power in the pew, power in the pew. Yes, it is. If we ever unleash the power, signs and wonders, miracles, the blessings of God are flowing. And I'm just telling you, he's made us think that we got to always go searching, running over here to this revival and running over to this special meeting and running over. And he says, listen, children, he says, this thing does not come with observation saying, look over here and look over there. He says, this thing is on the inside of you. It's on the inside of you. It's on the inside of you. It's on the inside of you. He's tricked us and deceived us to make us think that we are bankrupt when we carry the one in us. The riches of his glory. To be able to comprehend. It is a mystery of the gospel. Of the riches. He said I pray that you might have an understanding of what the riches of the glory of the Lord is toward the saints. Toward them that do believe. And you see one of the things, one of the great things that we've not come to understand is that Satan does not need to possess you. If he can deceive you. He's called the great deceiver for a reason. In fact, he possesses you through the deceptive philosophy that he brings into your mind to make you think that you can live any kind of way and still be pleasing to God. What deception to make us think that we can call wrong right and make it so because we have declared a thing. Why would he need to possess a person that he has deceived? He still gets his end result in the end. And so if you believe the lies that he plants in your mind, you're already defeated. Yeah. Satan can defeat people with a lie that he plants in your mind. He's coming after you. Now, I want you to notice what God plants in the heart. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11 in the Amplified Version. Notice this. He, speaking of God, made everything beautiful and appropriate in its time. He has also, I want you to hear this carefully, he has also planted eternity, a sense of divine purpose in the human heart. Notice where he planted it. He planted it in the human heart, a mysterious longing which nothing under the sun can satisfy except God. And he says, and yet man cannot find out, comprehend, grasp what God has done, his overall plan from the beginning to the end. But he has hidden this. He has planted eternity, a sense of divine purpose in the human heart. This mysterious longing which nothing under the sun can satisfy except God. And he chose to plant it in our hearts. No wonder Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within you. It's within you. It's right within reach. There are some things that are hidden from us, but there are some things that are hidden for us. It's hidden for you. It's hidden for you. And listen, there are some things that create crisis for us and obscure the greater one within. See, the greater one is within you, but there are some people who have that, the, the, the view of the greater one obscured by a few things. 
And I, I, I would say, let me give you four things. Number one is the choice overload, the choice overload. We live in a day now where we have too many choices. And you know, when you have too many choices, it can paralyze you. I know women that stand in their closet for 30 minutes trying to figure out what they're going to wear. But I bet it wouldn't take you 30 minutes if you didn't have but two outfits. <laughs> See, we, we've, got a, we, we've got the choice overload. I grew up, we had ABC, CBS, NBC, and we thought we were doing something when we had Channel 17. <laughs> the, 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 the Turner Broadcast, I mean, when, you know, when we had then 36 and, and 46, we didn't know what to do with ourselves. Now you got over 500 channels. And, and, and God knows, I mean, then everybody's got a channel on the internet. I mean, it, it's, it's so many choices. You, 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 it's hard to even know which cereal brand to buy, which toothpaste to buy, which shampoo to buy, because we have choice overload. We have choice overload. You can get stuff any kind of way that you want. And now, we don't even know what we want and what we want to do because we have choice overload. When you didn't have but A, B, or C. Oh, you know, you had to, you know, when I was in school, you, you, you had a, you, you had an A lunch and a B lunch. In the big schools, we had a, we, we did grow and then we had to have a C lunch. And, but, but our choices were so limited. They were incredibly limited. And so I'm glad that I didn't have to flip through 500 channels. I never had a problem of figuring out what I wanted to watch. And I didn't have a problem figuring out how long I was going to watch it. Because at midnight, <laughs> it signed off. Beep. It just signed off. If you had insomnia or worked a night shift, tough. It signed off. They didn't give you the choice to watch TV all night. We have choice overload, choice overload, choice overload. And now, if you watch a YouTube video, when that one finishes, five seconds later, a new one is starting. Choice overload. And then if you buy this kind of book, and when you finish that one, they're recommending three others, five others, that are similar to that one. And if you like this song, now they've got 25 other ones that they have, that are probably, we have choice overload. Here's the second thing, we have fear and anxiety. See, this creates crisis for us, and it also obscures the greater one within us, fear and anxiety. Uh, what are we fearful over? What are we anxious over? Over money? Over power? Over sex? Over our health? Just, just stressed out. Here's the third thing, too busy to slow down, too busy to slow down, always connected. We scared we're going to miss something. We got notifications on and notification to let us know that we got a notification. <laughs> we're just always connected. It's, it can't be healthy to always be connected to anything all the time and available 24-7. I mean, we're not God. He's the only one who never slumbers nor sleeps. And so when we are always just connected, too busy to slow down, and what that does is that it creates crisis for us and it obscures the greater one within. And then the fourth thing is the comparison mindset, comparison mindset, comparison mindset. Because as soon as you've got something, now you, you discover there's a newer model. Now there's a younger version. Now this one is, is smaller but yet more powerful. And so we've got to have it because now we're comparing it with everything else. Now, now we've got an issue because we posted something and, and, and we got 17 likes and our friends got 127 likes. <laughs> and we're comparing the success of what we do based on what somebody else is and how old we are and how somebody else who's our same age is so far beyond where we are. Comparisons. When you compare things, if you're better than others, it'll give you a false sense of pride. And then if you're worse, it'll create terrible insecurities in you. And that's why comparison is of the devil. God made us unique. He didn't make any two of us exactly alike. Even identical twins are not exactly alike. Their personalities are different. Their fingerprints are different. If God made a carbon copy of anything, one of them is unnecessary. 
So you have to learn to be who you are without comparisons. Don't compare your life to other folks. Just don't. There is no comparison between the sun and the moon. They shine when it is their time. They shine when it is their time. And so you may be the moon, and if it's daylight, listen, just hang in there. You're going to shine when it's your time. Tell somebody next to you, you're going to shine when it's your time. You're going to shine when it's your time. You're going to shine when it is your time. It's going to sh- you're going to shine when it is your time. Just learn to be comfortable in who you are and how God made you. Just inquire within. Inquire within. It's take your time and inquire within. I, I-, I love the, the commonsensical statement of the old African proverb, be what you is and not what you ain't, because when you is what you ain't, then you ain't what you is. Look within, look within. Just get quiet, get quiet, and just listen to what your insides are telling you. It's, it's a sadness in our society now when people are afraid to get alone and get quiet with their own thoughts. Some people have to always have things going. There's some people that can't even fall asleep at night without the television being on, without listening to music. They, they, they are afraid to be alone with their own thoughts. Just be still, just get quiet and listen. Get quiet and listen to what your insides are telling you. Listen to your body. Listen to your body. Do you know your body will tell you when it's time to rest? Listen to your body. Your body will tell you when you've had enough hot dogs, (laughs) enough beans. Your body will tell, listen to your body. You you, you know, do you know even you you, you can, uh, you can get ready to get involved with somebody and you get a queasy feeling in your stomach? It's really, I mean, listen, listen, just listen to your, to your body because feeling is the voice of the body. And sometimes you just get a, something will hit you in the pit of your stomach. It's like, don't, you, don't fool with him, don't fool with her. It'll just hit, boom, boom. And you're like, mm, what was that? And it's your body, God's, um, listen, look within, I'm just telling you. You'd be surprised. So pay attention to, to your body. Here's another thing, pay attention to your thoughts. How many of you all have had situations where, you know, you had a thought about something and then you sort of pushed it out of the way and then you found out later on that that first thought was right and you said, and then we say this, I should have listened to my first mind, my first mind, because God often leads us through first thoughts. He often leads us through first thoughts. Feeling is the voice of the body. Reason is the voice of the mind. Your thoughts have a voice. And then the third way is through your conscious. Your conscious speaks. Conscious is the voice of the spirit. It is the voice of the spirit. Feeling is the voice of the body. Reasoning, your thoughts, is the voice of the mind. But conscious is the voice of the spirit. And that's why when you do something wrong, God will convict you and you're conscious. Your conscience will, will convict you. He'll speak through the voice of conscience. So listen, listen within. You, you're getting ready to do something? Listen within. Take, take time and inquire within. Take time and inquire within. And listen, whenever you're having personal challenges or inner conflict, it means you have to change something. You have to change something. And, and, and here's the first thing that you have to change. Look at changing yourself. Yourself. I love what Viktor Frankl said. He said, when we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. When we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. Look at changing yourself. Whenever you're having personal challenges or inner conflict, you have to change something. You have to change something. Look at yourself first and say, is there something that I need to change? Is there somebody that I need to forgive? Is something I need to let go of? Do I need to change something? Then if it's not you, you might need to change your goals. Because sometimes we're going after the wrong target. We, we, we've got, we're trying to climb the ladder of success and then you get halfway up and, and recognize then that the ladder was leaning against the wrong building. So sometimes we have to change our goals. Suppose the goal is the wrong goal. Suppose you've, you've got all, suppose a young guy has all of his goals on getting this one girl. And suppose she's the wrong girl. Sometimes you have to change the goal. 
Because if you're having personal challenges and inner conflict, you have to change the goal. Here's the third thing. You have to sometimes change your timing. Your timing. You have to change something. Because remember, there's seed, time, and then there's harvest. And there's sometimes that we're trying to do something in the wrong season. So the timing is wrong and it doesn't work because the timing is wrong. And then we look at somebody else who's in a different season of their life and it's working for them and then we wonder why it's not working for us. But it is about the timing. You have to sow in the right season. The tree brings forth its fruit in its season, in its timing, in its timing. And then here's another thing that you have to think about. If, if you're having personal challenges or inner conflict, you, you, you have to change your pace your pace because sometimes it may be a problem of pace you might be stressed out it's because your pace is too rapid you see you have to realize you're running a marathon not a sprint and if you run a marathon at sprint pace you're going to burn out so it's not that you're running the wrong race but you're running at the wrong pace you're running at the wrong pace so you have to slow your roll slow your roll slow your roll Make sure the pace, because there are some people that fall out with heart attacks and strokes because they were operating at too rapid of a pace. Isn't it amazing to you how older people who have less time on the earth are so much more patient? They take their time getting ready. They take their time driving. You ever be behind, behind somebody? Isn't it amazing how they can wind up in front of you? <laughs> but they're just not in a hurry. They, they take their time. If they're going on a trip, they start packing two weeks ahead of time. They just, it's, it's, it's just the way that it is. And, and, and young people who have all the time in the world are in a rush. <laughs> they're just, they're so impatient. They wanted it yesterday. I mean, if they've been on a job for three months, they wonder why they've not been promoted to vice president, executive vice president now. You've been there for three months, for God's sake. You don't even, you haven't even fully learned the culture of the organization. You're still going through orientation. <laughs> you have to learn the pace. And see, can you imagine the frustration that it can bring to you if you feel like you should be further along than what, what you are? And you're rushing your pace, burning yourself out. So sometimes you have to just change your pace. Here's the next thing you have to change sometimes. Sometimes you have to change your process. Progress comes by process. And sometimes the process of what you're doing, if you're burning out, your process is outdated. And you need to create a, 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 a process that works to help facilitate you and save you uh, time, energy, and money, and frustration. Now, this is not the kind of message that will make you pull your shoes off and take off running around the church. But it will help us to do better and to be better just by being uh, uh, aware that there is a real kingdom within, inquire within. Examine your process, examine your process, examine your process. Oftentimes frustration is a symptom of a disorganized life. And you can take the same person that can come into a situation where everything is chaotic and hectic and it's because uh, they have a process where they understand, all right, we've got to get this with our inventory control. We've got to get the accounts receivables here. We've got to get marketing going over here. They understand process. And they can come in with something that is frustrating another person out of their wits because they don't understand process. And here's the final thing. You may need to change partners. Or you may need a partner because you're trying to do everything yourself. And you don't have the ability to multiply until there are at least two. And sometimes you need the right person who has the connection, the hookup of what you need. There's a different set of resources that they can bring to the relationship. And, and, and it's, it's when th th there is a reason, there's a reason that when Jesus sent them out, he always, without exception, sent them by twos. Paul and Silas, Peter and John, he sent them by twos. He sent them by two. He, 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 he gave them a partner because one can put a thousand to flight, but two can ten, 10,000. So your, it, your, your 
productivity becomes exponential when you get a partner, when you get a partner, when you get a partner. So it's, it's about sometimes examining whether I need to change the partners that I have, whether I need to add a partner to me, or if I've got an unproductive partner that's got me doing, you know, 98% of the work, and then they want to share equal with the profits. But isn't it, it, it isn't interesting how sometimes we often expect too much of others and too little of ourselves? Inquire within. Inquire within. There's some people that almost lose their mind when they lose their job. But when you lose your job, what you still have is all of your capacity. You still have all of your potential. Listen to me. Your skills are more valuable than your money. Your skills are more valuable than your money because your skills are transportable. You can transport your skills. You have a storm that destroys this location. If you've got skills, you can open another location. Don't, don't worry about what you've lost as long as you've got your skills. If you've got your skills, you can build again. You can build again. You can build again. And listen, stop looking for things on the outside to make you feel fulfilled on the inside. There are too many people that they just feel like if they get the right eyelashes and the right texture of weave. <laughs> and if they can figure out whether I want acrylic nails or gel nails, <laughs> and whether I want them flat or pointed, if, if, if they can just... They, they, they feel as though if, if I can get into this house, if I, if I can just get this car, if I can just get the jewelry, if I can get the new shoe, the, if I can get the latest edition of the telephone, uh, then I'll I, I really be happy. If I can just get this man, if I can just get this woman. Listen, no, no, no. Stop looking on the outside for things that make you feel fulfilled on the inside. Because you know what I found? I found that sometimes when people have lost their, the integrity of who they are and they've lost their family in the pursuit of success, if they'd really be honest with themselves, they would say, you know what? We were happier when we were back in that little one-bedroom apartment and our furniture, we were still paying on it every week. But we were happier when we didn't have anything. And now we got all of this stuff. And I done put you in all these big old houses. <laughs> you, you got more clothes than you know to do when you're still complaining. About the... <laughs> but she's in there by herself. She didn't want a vacation from you. She wanted one with you. And sometimes if, when they realize that they've gained the whole world and then almost lost their soul, stop looking for things on the outside to make you feel fulfilled on the inside. And here's what you should do. Make a list of the things that make you happy. Make a list of the things that make you happy. And then secondly, make a list of the things that you do every day. Make a list of the things that you do every day. Then compare the list. And number four, adjust accordingly. Now take a picture of that. <laughs> Just get that process. Get that process. I want you to, I'm serious. Take your, take your phone out. Take a picture of that. Make a list of the things that make you happy. Make a list of the things that you do every day. Compare the list and adjust accordingly. You know what? Because people say that they want this particular harvest because they need this harvest, but you don't reap the harvest that you need. You reap the harvest that you sow for. Make a list of what makes you happy. Make a list of what you do every day. Compare the list and adjust accordingly. I love something that Norman Cousins said. He said that Death is not the greatest loss in life. The greatest loss is what dies in us while we live. There's too much that has died in us while we live, and it's because we never inquire within. We never inquire within. Never inquire within. And sometimes you don't even know what's in you until you come under stress. You don't know what's in a sponge until it comes under pressure. And whatever's in the sponge, when it comes under pressure, it's coming out. It's coming out. You see, when God pushes you to the edge, trust him fully. Because only one of two things can really happen. Either God will catch you when you fall, or God will teach you how to fly. Amen. 
And just realize that the inward person of the heart needs a place of retreat. Your inner man needs a place of retreat. Your inner man needs a place of retreat. He needs a man cave. She needs a woman cave. We're Batman and Catwoman lovers. I mean, I, 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 I don't. But your inner person needs a place of retreat. Always have a place of refuge that you can go for renewal, for peace, for perspective. You need a place that you can go for renewal, for peace, for perspective. And although we always need a, a place of retreat, I want you to realize that there's absolutely no place that you can go to hide from God. Some people feel like, you know, man, man I'm, I'm doing, you know, see, prayerlessness is a form of hiding from God. Sitting out from church is a, is, a, is a form of people hiding from God. You can't hide from God. You know what God said in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 24? Notice this. He says, no one can hide so that I can't see him, declares the Lord. He said, I feel heaven and earth. I feel heaven and earth. He says, no one can hide so that I can't see him. I mean, what are you going to do it in the boot just because you turn the lights off? <laughs> no, he says, no one can hide so that I can't see him. And I want you to realize that we are not enough by ourselves. See, the, the great deceiver, he's told people, it's all, use the power of self. No, the, 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 that's, self is what's gotten us into this mess. We're in our trouble. All of our trouble is because of pleasing self, aggrandizing the desires of the flesh, pleasing self. But we are not enough by ourselves. Romans chapter 7, verse 18. This is the apostle Paul. Notice, Paul says, for I know that nothing good dwells in me. This man wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. And, and he's an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, working signs and wonders, miracles in his life. And, and if the apostle is saying, I know that no good thing dwells in me, and he says, that is in my flesh, for I have a desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. I can't even walk this thing. You know why? Because we have to be yielded to him. We need him. We need him. It is impossible to live in a way that is inconsistent with how you see yourself. The secret of our ability is who indwells and who empowers us. That is the secret of our ability. It is who indwells us and who empowers us. That's why we remember in uh, uh, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Say that with me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. See, that's the secret of our strength. It's not that I do all of this because I believe in myself. I mean, you should believe in yourself, but don't believe that it's all just about you. Because you can give things your best shot. And if you don't have God's divine protection in your life, you can work hard and you can lose everything that you have worked for years overnight. Somebody can sue you. You can have an accident. You, can, you don't know what could happen. In the economy, could term topsy-turvy and all of your investments and everything that you ha have, your houses, your buildings could catch on fire and burn up and the insurance company could, could, could go belly up. And, and you think that there is security in the things that are in this world? No, no, no. The kingdom of God is within. You've got to be able to have that righteousness, that peace, and that joy by this thing that comes on the inside. And it is not because of just willpower. You can't do that. He says, I don't have the ability in me to do it. And I know a lot of people think that you can just set your willpower. Your willpower is not duly squat without the Holy Ghost. You need the Holy Ghost. You need God on the inside working to help you. I don't care how much you have said your little personal confession and how much you believe in yourself. You ought to believe in yourself. But more importantly than believing in yourself is believing in the greater one who lives on the inside of you. But you have to go to that secret place with God because not being connected to God obscures your identity. Not being connected to God obscures your identity. It obscures your identity. I'm just telling you, you if your identity gets hijacked, and I'm telling you, in the natural, in the world, we have so many people now that are so wrapped up in, in this thing. It's a whole profession. Some people make their living through identity theft. And in the spirit, there are demons 
who are assigned for nothing but identity theft. And they rip the identity of your son and your daughter, your niece and your nephew, your grandchild. He's just coming to steal their identity because if they don't know who they are, misbehaving is inevitable. They will misbehave. Being in Asia, walking down the street, and I saw so many different places. In one tattoo shop that I passed by, you know, they had all kinds of things, birds and butterflies and dragons and all kinds of tribals and different kinds of things that people could get tattooed on them. And one struck my eye when I saw it, it said, born loser. And, and I'm saying to myself, who in their right mind would get born loser tattooed on them? And you know, I, I, I like the Asians because they, they, don't, they don't use a whole lot of words to say what they need to say. They just, they, they say it, but with minimal words. And I said, does anybody get this tattoo, born loser? And this was his response. Before tattoo on body, tattoo on mind. <laughs> and there are people who've not necessarily been possessed by the devil, but deceived by the devil to believe that they're a born loser. Because some people feel like nothing, I never win. And everything that I put my hand on, I seem to mess up and, and, and I, I end up with a bad hand. I, I, I end up hurt all the time. I'm always the one that's giving and helping everybody else. And I ain't got nothing myself. I'm going to help everybody. And, you know. and then they start feeling as though they are a born loser. They've lost sight. The image of the greater one who abides on the inside is obscured. Because if he can make you feel like you are a worthless piece of trash, he can get you to misbehave like a worthless piece of trash. And if he can make you think that you are common, common. No, 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 no. First Peter 2, 9, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. I didn't make a common people. I didn't make any two of you alike. I made anointed, fire-baptized, creative, daring, courageous people that get up in the morning and have an ability to be able to trust me when they can't even trace me, that are willing to fall down and get back up and receive my grace in their life. There's nothing boring, dull, and insipid and common about trusting God and watching God do something miraculous in your life and deliver your son and your daughter and keep your mind when you should lose it. There's nothing common about your using your faith to finish school and to get your degree and to believe God to give you favor on your job and to bless your career and to give you favor with people to be able to open doors for you. You think that we are common? There is something on the inside of you that is bigger than anything that you've really ever thought. I can't even figure out how is it that we can even contain a measure of who God is by the greatness of who he is. Take your seat. Let's go just a little deeper. Let's go just a little deeper. Because the most powerful force that we all carry within us is the power of choice to change course at any time. Most powerful choice that you have is the power to change course. The devil is a lie to make you think that you are stuck with your, the hand that you've been dealt with. you got the power of choice. You can change course at any time. You're born in a day, you die in a day, and you can change direction in a day. You can do an about face in a day. That's all that it takes is a day, and you can change direction in a day, in a day, in a day, in a day. And I just want to remind you that the most important conversations that you will ever have are the ones that you'll have with yourself asking hard questions. You gotta ask some hard questions of yourself. The hard questions that you ask of yourself are the ones that become the most defining in your life. And this may not make you shout, but it'll help you. Asking the hard question. Here's some of the hard questions that you need to ask. Who am I? Who am I? And the greater one on the inside, he knows. He knows. Everything that we have in Christ, you just go through your Bible and the New Testament and everything in him, through him, by him, and it'll give you a composite picture of who you are. You'll get the identity. We are hid with God in Christ, in Christ. 
You don't even see our identity until you're in Christ. And that's why God doesn't see our sin, because we are hidden with God in Christ. In Christ, and Jesus has covered it with his own blood. The question, who am I? Who am I? And then why am I here? You've got to have that conversation with yourself. Why am I here? What's my purpose? What am I doing? What am I doing? Have that conversation. What am I doing? What am I doing? Some of you are stuck in the mud. You, you, you've been walking around the mountain too long now. And it's time now that God's saying, turn north. Turn north. It's time for you to go up now. It's time for you to shift into another level now. You've been on this level long enough. Then this question here, this is the, this is the Mac Daddy that will open up some things. Who is influencing my life? Who? Have that question. Ask that question with yourself. Who is influencing my life? And when you ask that question, here's some other questions that flow out of that. How do they have me feeling? How do they have me? That person that's influencing my life. How do they have me feeling? What do they have me looking at? What do they have me listening to? What do they have me doing? What do they have me reading or not reading? And has having them in my life strengthened my relationship with God or weakened it? And then this one, have they made me better or worse? That's at the end of the day, you need to ask yourself that question. Have they made me better or worse? This is a great photo op. Have they made me better or worse? And listen, once you have those questions in that internal question, I want you to realize this. You are the CEO of your life. And a CEO has the authority to hire, fire, demote, and promote as he sees fit as she sees fit. You're the CEO of your life. After you go through those internal questions, who's influencing my life? What do they have me doing? How do they have me feeling? What do they have me looking at? What do they have me reading? What do they have me listening to? How, what, what, what are they, where have they taken me? Am I, am I closer? Is my relationship closer to God or more distant from Him? And am I better as a result of being with Him or not? Ask yourself these defining questions because they all relate to that great kingdom that's within because when the devil wants you to start focusing on the wrong thing he creates external distractions to cause you to become spiritually bankrupt within and he knows that there is a treasure of God that is hidden on the inside of he's Christ in you Christ in you, the hope of glory. And see, I love something that Stephanie uh, Gretzinger said. She said, you are most yourself when you are wrapped up in your purpose, not your position. You are most yourself when you are wrapped up in your purpose, when you are doing what you were born to do, when you are doing what you're called to do, than to be in your position. Be wrapped up in your purpose, not in your position. It should be purpose over paycheck. And your purpose is within you. Your purpose is within you. And, and how you do your job is not a reflection of, of how you feel about your job or your boss. It is a reflection of how you feel about yourself. So you look for a job that you will do even if you didn't need a job. And let me just tell you this. You can look around at people who may be near you, but just because a person doesn't talk about their problem doesn't mean that he or she doesn't have any. But I want you to be honest with yourself. Because making mistakes is better than faking perfection. It really honestly is. But at the same time, don't underestimate yourself. Don't underestimate yourself. Never assume that loud is strong and quiet is weak. Don't ever assume that. You'd be surprised when God got ready to have a leader to lead the nation he didn't try to get the loudest, most boisterous person with the most type A personality. He got Moses, who was the meekest man. Moses was almost timid. He, was, he had a feeling of inadequacy. And God says, I'm going to choose you. He wasn't choosing somebody that didn't need his help. He was choosing somebody that when God did it through them, people would know this is God. Because the nations 
that saw what God did through Moses didn't just fear Moses, they feared the God of Israel. It brought attention to God. But nothing holds you back more than your own insecurities. And you know when you think that you're on the verge of a breakdown, please don't lose hope. Because also when you're right on the verge of a breakdown, you're also many times right on the verge of a miracle. You really are. And I just want you to think about this, that if you look into a situation with the wrong focus, you will affect the outcome if you look at something with the wrong focus. Because if you focus on what's wrong, you'll destroy what's right. And this is a word of wisdom to, to every married person and to every parent. Because you have to be careful how you treat your marriage and how you treat your children. If you always focus on what's wrong, you'll destroy what's right. And then you'll discover that the areas of your focus are also the areas of your reward and the areas of your neglect are the areas of your pain. So watch your focus. Watch your focus. So stop searching for peace and happiness. It's not out there waiting to be found. It's inside of you waiting to be enjoyed. It's the kingdom of God. It is the rule and the domain of the king that comes right on the earth is wherever you will invite Christ to come in and exercise his character, his nature through you. And realize that happiness is an inside job. It's an inside job. It is totally an inside job. You have to look within. Just because you're down doesn't mean that you're out. Look within. Look within. Most people don't give up at the bottom of the mountain. They go halfway up and then give up. The message is, keep going. Yeah. Don't get halfway up. Don't get halfway through. That's where the greatest struggle and the greatest temptation to quit is halfway through. Yeah. Why do you think we call it midlife crisis? <laughs> it's halfway through. Halfway through. But listen, when you make yourself the end of all things, you eventually meet disappointment and despair. If you make yourself the end of all things, that's why I'm not the captain of my own ship. I'm here to do my Father's will. What I see the Father doing is what I do. It's not us just doing our own will. You see, there is a God-shaped void in every man and every woman and every boy and every girl that only God can fill. And if you try to fill it with anything else, drugs, money, sex, position, power, fame, Nothing else will do. Nothing else will do. Psalm 4610 in the God's Word translation says, Let go of your concerns, and then you will know that I am God. I rule the nations. I rule the earth. Old King James Version just says, Be still and know that He is God. Be still. Chill out. Cease struggling. Stop fighting. Stop Warring. Stop warring. Stop warring. Stop warring. Because there is such a dichotomy that has come into the body of Christ. That I've never met so many duplicitous bipolar Christians. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. And he's calling us. As he's saying that I want to be able to restore you. I want to make you better than what you are. And you've been focusing on the very thing that you need really being something on the outside, but he's saying, no, 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 there's something on the inside. The kingdom of God is within you. It's within you. It's within you. You've been filling it up with the wrong thing. It's within you. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.